I'm happy to be here today to talk about my new book, Love, Sex, and Marriage in Victorian America. No one better exemplifies the popular notion of the buttoned up, old maid Victorian American prude than purity crusader Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation is best remembered for crusading against alcohol. But she was also enthusiastically against tobacco, politicians, and sex. She lectured young couples on the evils of buggy riding. She stopped women on the street to warn them against the dangers of seduction. And she wrote a newspaper column whose main theme was the evil of self-abuse. After two disastrous marriages, in which her husbands resented her overzealous Christianity and she resented their overzealous embraces, Carrie Nation concluded that men were, quote unquote, nicotine soaked, beer besmeared, whiskey greased, red eyed devils, and two legged animated whiskey flasks. People like Carrie Nation have given us a view of Victorian America. We think we know the Victorians, do we? First, let's look at Victorian marriage. The culture that arose in Britain and America as a result of urbanization and industrialization embraced an ideology of separate spheres of male and female activity, the public and the private. The public sphere belonged to men, the private sphere to women. Authority over the family was legally vested in men, which profoundly influenced a woman's ability to control property, dissolve her marriage, or ensure custody of her children. A woman's right to own property emerged slowly. Mississippi passed the first Married Women's Property Act, in 1839. In 1845, Massachusetts passed similar legislation, with New York following suit in 1848. In 1855, Massachusetts, far in advance of the rest of the Union, legislated to protect the wages of working married women, which were at that time the legal property of her husband. In the 1840s and 1850s, an ideology arose on both sides of the Atlantic about women. Women were said to have no sexual appetites of their own. They only had sex to satisfy the needs of their husbands and for reasons of procreation. Some advice literature argued that women were inherently chaste and pure. Women were expected to be the moral guardians of the home, stemming the lustful natures of men. The gentle and submissive Victorian wife was sexually inhibited. Her repressed upbringing, the spirituality forced upon her, and her ignorance of physiology all combined to make her nervous and skittish. While many women acknowledged experienced sexual desire, they also expressed feelings of guilt and confusion about their sexual lives. For the most part, women thought that sexual relations should be confined to marriage, and the vast majority believed that reproduction was the primary aim of sexual activity. Most women tried to follow this Victorian norm and felt guilty when they failed to live up to the ideal. Some advice manuals assured women that frigidity was a virtue to be cultivated and a condition to be desired. Other manuals indicated that sex must be cherished as one of the few legitimate pleasures. On the other hand, Henry C. Wright, a reformer, abolitionist, and lecturer on marriage, stated categorically, progress, not pleasure, is our aim. The purest enjoyment is indeed designed to be experienced in intercourse when prompted solely by love and desire for offspring. 
Although not a universal opinion, the passionless female became a dominant ideal in the North. This was less true in the South, which, while valuing female chastity, did not deny female sexual desire, nor promote the ideal of the passionless woman. Women in the South were, in fact, considered more prone to moral weakness than men because of their quote-unquote emotional natures. The new ideology promoted not only female purity, but male abstinence. The new ideology urged men to avoid all sexual stimulation before marriage and to practice great control within marriage. All right, let's look at babies and birth control. Most women in Victorian times dreaded continual pregnancies. Even Queen Victoria, who bore nine children, openly expressed her dislike of childbirth. In middle-class circles, pregnancy was too indelicate a subject to discuss. Voluminous clothes hid the increasing size of the mother-to-be, who tended to stay in virtual hiding until after birth. The first child was usually born within 18 months of the wedding. Few mothers gave birth in a hospital. Public hospitals did not exist. And those who could afford the services of a private hospital preferred the security of home. Childbirth was regarded as a natural process requiring no special medical environment or equipment. It was, however, a potentially dangerous undertaking. Infant mortality in Massachusetts during the mid-19th century, for example, hovered around 15% compared to less than 1.5% today. Nationwide, pregnancy-related causes accounted for more than 5% of all adult female deaths. The average Victorian woman bore eight children. One out of every six of these children died before the age of one. A baby born in mid-Victorian era had a 50% chance of living to become an adult. Well, to spare the wife the physical strain of pregnancy, or spare the family the financial burden of another child, couples often looked for ways of preventing pregnancy. Because of the delicate nature of the subject, even educated people often knew nothing about contraception. The first works on contraception published in the United States were Moral Physiology, 1831, and The Fruits of Philosophy, 1832. Both of these works describe a full range of contraceptive techniques while rejecting the idea of intervening in the natural sex act. Official opinion, both legal and religious, was deeply hostile to contraception. Despite official disapproval, however, by 1839, each book had gone through nine editions, placing some 30,000 books in circulation. Contraceptive devices were rudimentary, and included diaphragms, douches, the safe period of a woman's ovulatory cycle, and coitus interruptus. Home remedies such as engaging in vigorous dancing and horseback riding after intercourse were popular. The discovery of vulcanization in 1843 led to the manufacture of a crude, heavy type of condom that was used with increasing frequency. One wag described these early condoms as a breastplate against pleasure and a cobweb against danger. Abortion rather than contraception was the primary form of birth control. In mid-19th century America, 
it is estimated that there was an abortion for every five live births. William Buchan's domestic medicine contained prescriptions for bringing on delayed menstrual periods, which would also produce an abortion if the woman happened to be pregnant. The book prescribed heavy doses of purgatives that created violent cramps, powerful douches, violent exercise, raising great weights and falling down. In America, most states had laws restricting abortion by the early 1860s. But these laws were directed at unqualified abortionists and were intended to protect women. Procuring an abortion was not a crime in South Carolina and was illegal in Massachusetts only after the fetus had stirred. Most Americans of this period did not regard abortion as a crime until the fetus had quickened, that is, begun to perceptibly move in the womb. According to the prevailing view of the time, the fetus had no soul before quickening and had not demonstrated its independent existence through movement. Until quickening, the fetus was regarded as an extraneous part of the pregnant woman that could be removed without ethical constraint. By the 1870s, couples in all classes were choosing to limit and plan family size by a variety of means within a culture of abstinence. Considerate husbands who did not insist on intercourse, were admired, not least because of the high mortality rate among pregnant women. It was perhaps a good thing that husbands had decided to privately abstain from sex, since by the mid-1870s, the United States government had invaded every bedroom in the nation. In the 1870s, a social purity movement, spurred on by evangelical Protestants, launched a crusade against vice, including contraception, which was considered to lead to lewd, immoral behavior and promote promiscuity. Well, it's not surprising that such a movement arose. The industrialization that swept America during and after the Civil War ushered in a morality problem of great magnitude, and this included widespread prostitution. As urbanization flourished, so did prostitution. The majority of prostitutes were young, illiterate, and poor. Higher wages for less work appealed to many young women. With little in the way of birth control, frequent pregnancies occurred among the prostitutes. Since being pregnant would pit them out of work, abortion became the alternative for the tens of thousands of prostitutes in America's teeming cities. The moral laxness, laxness sweeping much of America began to impact public opinion. Social purity advocates proclaimed social crimes like infanticide that were once placed on the same level as murder are now not only looked upon with complacency but are defended. The social purity movement successfully pressured Congress into passing the Comstock Act, named after the movement's leader, Anthony Comstock. This happened in 1873. The Comstock Act was a federal law which, among other things, prohibited mailing any article or thing designed or intended for the prevention of conception or procuring of abortion as well as any form of contraceptive information. 24 states passed similar state laws, collectively known as the Comstock Laws. Sometimes these extended the federal law by outlawing the use of contraceptives, as well as their distribution. The most restrictive state laws of all were in Connecticut. Here, married couples could be arrested for using birth control in the privacy of their own bedroom. 
and could be subjective to a one-year prison sentence. As late as 1960, 30 states had statutes on the books inspired by the Comstock Clause prohibiting or restricting the sale and advertisement of contraceptive devices. Until the 1870s, abortion was legal before quickening, approximately the fourth month of pregnancy. After the rise of the social purity movement, abortion was criminalized state by state. Abortion prior to quickening became a crime. However, then as now, wealth had its privileges. Middle and upper class women could still obtain access to abortion although this was now more difficult and expensive. In an 1888 expose, reporters from the Chicago Times obtained an abortion referral from no less a person than the head of the Chicago Medical Society. Poor women had access only to the most dangerous methods. Well, let's look at some Victorian vice. <clears throat> Many husbands felt they were doing their wives a favor by taking their animal instincts elsewhere. Men of all ages, married and unmarried, from city lawyers to visiting country storekeepers to sailors, turned to brothels for sexual release. These brothels ranged in quality and general excellence from the parlor houses situated not far from the city's best hotels through more numerous and moderately priced houses that drew artisans and clerks, down to the dockside grog shops, catering to sailors. The majority of prostitutes, as we've said, were young, illiterate, and poor, with few options avail available to earn a living. Immigrants and country girls were open to the lure of occasional or full-time prostitution in America's fast-growing cities. This was particularly true of women associated with certain luxury trades, girl assistants in glove and leather goods shops, confectioners and tobacconists, who were constantly brought into contact with rich customers and commercial travelers. They often found it difficult to resist the temptation to take the easy route to a more affluent life. From New Orleans to Boston, city theaters were also important sexual marketplaces. Men bought tickets less to see the performance than to make assignations with prostitutes, who by custom sat in the topmost gallery seats. The women received free admission from the theater man who drew patrons by their very presence. The money from casual prostitution opened up a world beyond the life of the tenement and was considered by many young working class women as a transitional occupation that would not prevent them from eventually settling down and marrying, some even with their former clients. Of course, prostitution was illegal under the vagrancy laws, but the laws were not well enforced. Brothels flourished. By 1890, there were an estimated 65,000 prostitutes working in America's cities out of a total population of 62 million. Let's look at uh, <clears throat> divorce. Laws concerning divorce varied widely among the states. In New England, where the Puritans had defined marriage as a civil contract rather than a religious sacrament, secular law had provided for divorce as early as the 17th century. Like any other contract, the marriage bond could be broken when either of the contracting parties failed to meet the obligation contract imposed, adultery, impotence, desertion, or convicting, conviction for serious crimes were all grounds for divorce. 
Additionally, wives could obtain divorce on the grounds of non-support. In most states in the early 19th century, an act of the legislature was required to end a marriage. As the century progressed, divorce laws became more liberal. During the 1850s, Indiana was widely condemned for its liberal ways. A couple in Indiana could obtain a divorce on any grounds that a judge ruled proper. Well, Indiana judges were far more permissive than the New York City judge, who in 1861 refused to grant a divorce to a wife whose husband had beaten her unconscious in an argument over letting the family dog sleep on the bed. The judge advised the woman that one or two acts of cruel treatment were not proper grounds for divorce. Indiana's liberal stance on divorce attracted a flood of applicants from other states. The influential newspaper editor and future presidential nominee, Horace Greeley, denounced Indiana as the paradise of free lovers whose example would soon lead to a general profligacy and corruption such as this country has never known. Well, the Victorians had alternative marriages, much as we do today, as an issue. In 1862, Congress passed a law prohibiting polygamy, or plural marriage. This law was aimed directly at the troublesome religious sect that had settled in Utah, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. The Mormons migrated to the Valley of the Great Salt Lake in 1847 to escape religious persecution brought about in part by the practice of polygamy. Although prohibited in the Book of Mormon, the sex underlying holy book, the idea of polygamy was accepted by the group's founder, Joseph Smith, and was pronounced by Smith's successor, Brigham Young, as necessary for salvation. Well, Brigham Young preached that polygamy was divinely sanctioned to enhance the church's population and to eliminate prostitution and adultery. Some women were dubious, coming to regard polygamy simply as a tool to satisfy the lusts of the older, more powerful male members of the sect. Brigham Young practiced what he preached, having some 27 wives during his lifetime. Most of Young's wives lived in a New England-style structure called the Lion House, located in a central block of Salt Lake City. When Young decided upon a bed partner for the night, he made a chalk mark on the selected wife's bedroom door. He fathered 56 children. The law passed in 1862 banning polygamy was fanatically prosecuted by the United States government. Men and women were fined and imprisoned until the Mormons finally submitted in 1890. Well, the Mormons were not alone in practicing an alternative form of marriage. Francis Wright's utopian community in Nashaba, Tennessee, founded in 1825, rejected the concept of marriage entirely. Wright and her followers argued that love and respect rather than legal ties should bind couples. When love and respect disappeared, couples should simply separate. In the state of New York, the Oneida community, founded in 1848, described marriage as contrary to natural liberty, a cruel and oppressive method of uniting the sexes. This group practiced a form of community marriage where each woman was married to every man and each man to every woman. The movement's founder, John Humphrey Noyes, coined the term free love and found scriptural justification for the concept. 
In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Matthew 22:30. <clears throat> the Oneida community lived together as a single large group and shared parental responsibilities. The concept of free love blossomed outside the Oneida community. Victoria Woodhull, the first woman to run for president in 1872, was called the High Priestess of Free Love. In 1871, Woodall wrote, Yes, I am a free lover. I have an inalienable constitutional and natural right to love whom I may, to love as long or as short a period as I can, to change that love every day if I please. Woodhull received fewer than 16,000 votes nationwide in her run for the presidency. Most Americans rejected alternative forms of marriage and pressured young people to marry conventionally. A man's credit rating depended in part on whether or not he was conventionally married and had children. To learn more about love, sex, and marriage in Victorian America, visit our website at www.timetravel21.com. Thanks for watching.